Hey, what's happening, everyone? I am going to talk about something that I can't stop thinking about, and I've shared on social media recently, but I wanted to flip on the camera right now because I was feeling inspired to go a little bit deeper even on my mushroom experience. So this past Saturday, so as of the recording right now, it's Tuesday, the Tuesday after the mushroom experience. And I want to kind of set the context to what brought me to that experience and then ultimately what it was like, what I what I experienced in the experience. And I think some people will be able to maybe relate to this because I did get a lot of feedback as I was sharing a, a few recap reflection videos about um, that night and having people say, geez, I really appreciate the fact that you said that you were scared before you went into it because I feel the same way. So it gives me the courage to maybe explore this as well. So that's my reasoning for wanting to go a little bit deeper. And I just want to talk a bit about some of the some of the uh, just sensory aspects of what I what I felt, what I heard, what I smelled, all of these different things. And then also what's come of it since that experience as well. So it's only been three days, but there's been all kinds of uh, disruption in my life. And yet I'm looking at it as an incredible opportunity. You know, there's there's maybe opportunity to go, oh boy, uh, things are seemingly unraveling around me, but I'm actually navigating it with a sense of calm. And not just me too, my wife as well, because she was also a part of the experience. So let me back it up a little bit. So the first time that I ever did mushrooms, magic mushrooms that is, was back in, I want to say like 98, 99, 1998, 1999. I thought it was more around 2001, 2002, but I actually reached out to my friend who I did it with at that time. And he was like, no, 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 that was the late 90s because it was the time when he was living in Saskatoon. He had a house, a basement suite um, in another good friend of ours house, uh, Brent May. And it was not enjoyable <laughs> to say the least. We went into the experience with the full intent on just getting effed up. Like there's no other way to put it. You know, we we're heading out to the bar. We were in our 20s. We were just having fun. We wanted the high, right? And that experience, I'll, I'll, I'll just say out loud what it was like. It was, you know, somebody pulled a couple of chocolates out of a freezer and said, here, let's do these tonight. And I was like, mm, I don't know. Okay, whatever. All my buddies are doing it. Let's do it. And then we went to the bar and the bar was lights and, uh, you know, strobe lights going and music pounding and people all over the place and lots of drinking happening and stuff like just a bad mix overall to be mixing with a magic mushroom. And then I remember that night we were walking home and we had to cross this field where there was a, a train track and it wasn't very far from where we were staying, but we got about halfway across that field and I looked over and we saw me and my buddy both saw this carpet that was rolled up just sitting in the middle of the field. And naturally we thought, oh my God, dead body. So we just ran as fast as we could, terrified about what we had experienced and seen. Got into the house, locked the door, sat down on the couch and we were like, whoa, did you see that? I saw it, did you see that? And then it got worse though, because my friend actually had a Spider-Man poster on the wall. Now I'll have to go back and look and see like, when did the Spider-Man movies come out? Like late, late 90s maybe, mid 90s? Probably late 90s, early 2000s. But anyways, he had a Spider-Man poster on his wall. And I remember that poster coming alive. I remember spiders crawling out from that poster. And it was, it was just such a bad experience. And then this friend of mine also, he had an obsession with really spicy chicken wings as well. So he had some in his fridge. <laughs> oh my God, I'm remembering this like it was yesterday now. But he had some in his fridge. And these were chicken wings where if you ate like 10 of them or something like that, you got your picture up on the wall at this place that sold these and you were a legend, right? And he had like seven of them in his fridge still because he ate three at the bar and almost died. And we both thought, well, let's have some chicken wings. So that just contributed to an even worse experience. Man, 
we do some stupid things when we're young. We think they're, we're invincible, don't we? But that was my last experience with mushrooms. Now, you can imagine then coming into this experience where I haven't done it at all since then, not recreationally, not in any kind of like proper set and setting or a ritual or anything like that. And just in the last year, of course, I've been expanding my uh, beliefs and my thought process and just my understanding about all things in life, not just around drugs, but also just around, you know, consciousness as a whole. And, you know, what do I believe to be true? And then why do I believe that exactly? And, and then looking at the polarization of like politics and, and healthcare and, you know, even sports and, and everything, all of these things. It just became so um, elevated in my life that like, okay, it's time to lean into everything. It's time to question everything, including going deep on topics like death. You know, it's something that I, I wouldn't say I've avoided it, but I certainly haven't attached myself to anything religious um, to be able to understand and just become grounded with the idea of we're only here for a finite amount of time in this physical body. Then what? What happens, right? And that's a big, deep, dark rabbit hole to go down, uh, but a good one. I'm glad that I did, and and I'm still exploring. I'm still understanding and learning these dimensions to life and and our past lives and and reincarnation and all of these things that I will continue to explore and bring people onto my podcast and have engaging conversations and share them with you because I think it's interesting and I think other people are interested in the topic as well and maybe just aren't brave enough to step up and say, I'm curious about that too. So let me lead the way. Let me go and have those conversations. I've got some really exciting conversations planned here with some incredible people very, very soon. And then most recently in the last like six months, of course, there was a bunch of things that led up to the extremely conscious retreat the very first one that we did in June. And coming to that event, we ended up having eight guys come to that event. And one of those individuals was a guy by the name of Craig Garden. And Craig is the co-founder CEO of a company called Aversio. So Aversio is uh, a manufacturer of medicinal slash functional mushrooms. So non-psychedelic, uh, all of the different typical mushrooms that can help with alertness, with, uh, you know, brain enlightenments with uh, helping you sleep. There's lots of different positive benefits to taking mushroom supplements, but they also have a side of their business called Aversio Labs. So when Craig came to our retreat, we didn't have any psychedelic mushrooms, but the conversation was really starting to ramp up then about the healing properties of mushrooms, magic mushrooms in particular, psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybin as well as the connection in these mycelium pathways and the way that everything in this world is connected, the trees, the mushrooms, all of this underground wiring. When you think about the Avatar movie, that's the thing that comes to mind. If you've ever seen that show where like all of these things light up between the trees, just go watch the uh, documentary. I can't even remember what it's called exactly right now, but there's a mushroom documentary on Netflix that talks about these mycelium pathways and the connection between everything in this world. It's absolutely fascinating. And that was one of the pieces of this ceremony that I experienced on Saturday was just having somebody guide the educational side of things and then the connection side of things with actually doing these magic mushrooms in a space that had a, a very specific set and setting and they and a ritual to the way that it was executed and the music and and just the whole setup of the space it was inside of this dome that is out at a property called la senda down here in costa rica it's about 15 minutes away from our house beautiful beautiful place and yeah it, that part of it was just uh amazing because uh ayama who was the person that led the whole experience along with her her husband yadi she really went into depth and, and took her time, like was very intentional with her words and the way that she was explaining things and allowing people to have it land and to really feel what it is to actually be connected to everything in nature, to each other, all of these different things. And then the experience itself was, there's a time before I did this and then there's a time after 
It's, it's literally like that. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that in a second. But I also want to address this one thing. So even though I've been having conversations and, you know, I had Craig on my podcast and we were talking about, you know, I said very transparently to him that like, I'm not going to lie, like I'm very curious to to dive into the world of uh, psilocybin and not just to, you know, have a trip, but even the microdosing aspect of it and how it can support me with clarity and my sleep and just accessing another level of, uh, you know, in light and heightened sensor or senses, you know, with sight and sound and smells and everything. But I'm scared, you know, there's a part of me that's a little scared because I'm like, man, I've been down this path before. I know what it was like. But of course, again, the set and setting of that first experience was not inducive of having a good experience, <laughs> put it that way. So there was a little bit of fear even going into this, even when I it came across my plate because I went out and visited the Lacenda property because I was interested in looking at it as a potential retreat location for the next extremely conscious man experience that we are hosting down here in Costa Rica. Now, we didn't decide to actually do it there, but we may still involve um, an experience at Lacenda as a part of the retreat slash experience that we have planned, even though we're going to be staying in a different place. More on that in a second. So I went out to this experience with a little bit of that fear, but at the same time, I was I was preparing myself and I was I was heading into it with the idea. And there was lots of feedback that was coming to me. In fact, you know, Mike Prince even said to me right before we were leaving in the vehicle, he said, you know, detach from expectation, go in um, uh, with an intent, an intention on having an incredible experience, but detach from uh, the expectations, right? Whatever it is, it is. And I was like, cool. All right. I can, I can do that. And when we arrived at the place, so it started at 8 PM and it ended at 7 AM. So it was an 11 hour experience and it's pitch dark here at 5 PM and there's not very many street lights. So it's very, very dark. So we drove out there. We ended up behind this, this other vehicle. And as we were approaching Lacenda, I looked up in front in the headlights of the vehicle in front of us and saw something kind of scurry across the road. And I was like, oh, that was weird. I wonder what the heck that was. And anyways, we pull into Lacenda and the road is like this winding thing. Like, in fact, I took a video of it. I should, I should share it. When we, when you first pull into Lacenda at night, there's these trees that kind of like arch over each other. It almost feels like you're in the headless horseman um it looks like a scary movie from into... the disney days when we were kids right you're driving in and you're like what in the hell is going on here but i've been out there before so i know this place it's gorgeous like there's a beautiful house out there an organic garden there's an amphitheater where they host events like live um, concerts and and uh, festivals and whatnot there's a sweat lodge out there there's this, this incredible labyrinth that's uh, all these cactuses and it's like intertwined that represents the, the feminine and the masculine. And it's all connected to these geometric shapes that are connected to something and something like it's just a magical place. The energy of the place is really incredible. And then there's this dome that was built actually by these guys that we met here who are architects locally. Um, who we are are exploring opportunities to work together and create some amazing things in this local community. So there was all of these connections to all of these pieces, right? And when we got out of the vehicle, so we parked at the house and we needed to go and talk to the lady at the house and be like, where are we supposed to go here? And she said, oh, you got to head down to the, um, to the labyrinth. And I said, okay, well, I've been down there before. I'll just walk you guys down because two other, these two other people were there as well. When Sharmila and I got out of the car, I looked down on the ground because I had to take my flashlight out on my phone and there was a big ass tarantula on the ground, like two feet from my feet. And I was like, oh shit, should I tell Charmilla about that? And then I walk around the car and there's another one <laughs> right where she was about to get out of the car. And she saw it and she was like, what are we doing right now? Like, seriously, if I don't feel good vibes about this in a second, I want to turn around and go back home. And I was like, you know, Let's just see this through. It's going to be amazing. This other couple's here too. You know, let's get to know them. Let's go for a walk. So we did. We started walking. We were chatting and stuff. And they were awesome people uh, right from the very get-go of meeting them. Just a good vibe with about them. Good energy. uh, Great conversation. She's from Brazil. He's from Argentina. Argentina. 
And we're walking down this road and it had been pouring rain um, that whole day. In fact, like the last three days and the roads are really rough here. So it was super slippery. So we had to like basically kind of scoot our feet down this road. And it was quite a ways. It was probably a kilometer or like almost a mile long. And we got down to this point where there's a sign that talks about the labyrinth. And I remembered in my head, like, okay, you need to turn at the sign. So I told everybody, I was like, oh, here it is. Here's the entrance. So we started walking into the bush. About 10 minutes walking into the bush, I realized that there was nothing around us. It was pitch dark. We were not on any kind of trail. And I was thinking, okay, I think we went the wrong damn way. So I said to everybody, I was like, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm pretty sure this is not the way we're going to have to walk back to the road. And they were all like, oh, don't worry. It's all good. You know, this is part of the adventure, which was amazing, right? Because it could have easily been like, oh my God, I can't believe we're even out here. But it wasn't that. I think everybody just had a kind of a nervous anticipation about being there. So we got back to the road, we walked down and eventually we saw the dome lit up and we were like, all right, here it is. And, and the entrance way to walk in was identical to the one that I, I took us down. So it really wasn't my fault, but it was kind of my fault because there was the, this rope of like um, these triangle shaped, uh, uh, whatever, just like a thing over between two posts type thing, right? It was very, very obvious that that is the entrance. And I forgot about that. So that was how the whole thing started. But we walk up to this place and naturally you just met, you just feel the magic in the air. You see the labyrinth and the, and the cactuses and you're just like, whoa. And then you see that dome lit up and the whole, all the stairs were lit up going up and we were like, okay, this is pretty cool. And we get inside and there's all of these chairs that are lined up around in a circle with a blanket in the middle that has all of these different, um, uh, oh, what did we call, what do we call them? They're not ritual, uh, just symbols like little statues and stuff. And they all have their own separate meaning. And I'm not going to, uh, meaning rather not meeting. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of all of the stuff with regards to the ceremony, because I really do honestly believe that people should experience this for themselves. So I'm not going to talk about the entire, the entirety of how the whole thing went down, but there was nine or 10 people there. And they were a very diverse group of people, right? So there was a lady that was there that had been there before about a year ago. Um, and she uh, had shared that she had had an amazing experience the last time and had an amazing relationship with Ayama. And, and she was the first person that spoke. And then I had a teacher who is also from the States. Both of these two people were from the US, but she was a teacher at one of the local schools down here. And then there was, of course, the two individuals that we met when we were walking out. And then there was a guy that was actually good friends with Yadi and Ayama, um, who there was an amazing part that happened at the very end. Um, but you could see just, just looking at him, it was like, whoa, this guy seems very grounded, very connected. Uh, in fact, he was sitting up in a cross-legged position practically the whole night every time i looked over at him he was sitting up and i was like man how is he doing that like my back was getting sore my knees were getting sore my feet were going numb and yet there he was just calm just calm the whole time and then there was a lady that was there with her son her son is 20 years old and she uh right before the pandemic started uh scooted down to costa rica from the us as well and got down there and said, yeah, I'm not leaving. And even told her husband said, so I'm moving to Costa Rica. You can come with me if you'd like or, or not, it's up to you. But she was like, I am moving here. And she initially at the start of the night, she had shared that she had lost 60 pounds being in Costa Rica and not due to, you know, some strict diet or exercise plan. It was just a shedding of her old self and some of the stresses that had come with the work that she was doing back home and, and just the calm that she had felt by being in Costa Rica and the vibe that's around this place. So there, everybody kind of had the initial introduction of, of who they are, right? And it was really interesting to hear people introduce themselves and why they were there. And for me, I just introduced myself in the way, like I just said, which was, you know, I've, I haven't done this for 23 years. The last time I did it, it was not in a set and setting like this. It was with the intent on just getting effed up and going to the bar. And I'm here to surrender to whatever it is uh, without expectation. But my intention is that it's going to be beautiful and it'll be exactly what it needs to be for me. And I didn't share part of the deeper thing that I was really focused on and wanting to experience, but I'll talk about that here in a second and how that came up at the end. 
Now, once we started with the whole ceremony and, you know, there was music involved and, oh my gosh, she, she actually has a background as a DJ even too. So she was, she put together this, this playlist that was a mix of uh, world music is what she referred to it as. So it was just music from all over the world and sounds and uh, the, the, the acoustics inside of this dome are just like, they're mind blowing. They really are. There was moments in the night where I remember just lying down on this, uh, this retractable bed thing and listening to the music. And then all of a sudden I would hear a voice that I kind of would look up and think like Is somebody talking and there was no movements. Nobody was talking, but yet you could hear these sounds. And there's no doubt that maybe the mushrooms had something to do with that as well, but just so vibrant. Like it's such an incredible experience, the sound aspect of all of this, let alone the psychedelic aspect of it. And when we decided, when we did start the actual ceremony of taking the mushrooms though, we had a choice and we were, we were talked through the whole scenario of like, have you done this before? What's your experience with it? What would you like your experience to be like? And then she would actually guide and say, okay, I think we should do this amount. And what I ended up doing was what is referred to basically as a microdose. So it was like a gram and then a gram and then a gram, three different times over the 11 hours. And what that created for me was just a, a calm and a, and a clarity and vibrant colors. I remember closing my eyes and just seeing shapes and and really vibrant colors and not a lot of detail with regards to, you know, anything profound even coming up for me. There was a couple of things that I wrote in this journal. I ended up bringing this journal here, which is the one that we gave to all the guys at the Extremely Conscious, oh, there we go, the Extremely Conscious Retreat that we did in June. So this is, uh, you know, for everybody that ends up coming, it's a part of the experience, but you can see that that is actually branded on the leather and we may or may not have an actual brand that uh, if you get to be a part of our retreat slash, slash experience, well, then you get to use the brand, but only on the leather, only on the leather. <laughs> it's not that kind of a retreat. It's not that extreme, I guess you would say. But one of the things that did come up for me as I was going through the experience was I was really focusing on or wanting to get clarity on um, something that I'm really leaning into and facing myself right now, which is judgment. So this awareness around, I judge other people, other people judge me, other people judge themselves. I judge myself, all of this judgment. And then just how toxic it is and how, how non-serving it is to be a judgmental person, right? And, and at least this is the perspective that I was coming into the experience with. And I was thinking, what, like, how do I shed this feeling of, of, of judgment? I look at somebody and I judge them. And, I, and in fact, even as we started the, the experience too, I remember looking at everybody and, and thinking something about them just by their looks or the way they were sitting or the way that they were fidgeting in their chair or the way that they were calm in their chair, whatever it might be. I remember thinking, I'm judging these people. I'm judging these people. I wonder what they're thinking about me. It was really interesting to have that level of awareness. But then one of the things that came up for me through the experience though, and I actually had to sit up. I was in a, a state where I was like, oh man, I could just like zone out right now and possibly even sleep. But I thought, no, you gotta get up and write something. And it's not even easy to read here because I was scribbling it in the dark, but I judge you, you judge me, you judge you, I judge me. That was all I wrote. But it was a reminder for me to go, okay, how do I see judgments? Am I looking at this from a perspective of negativity and wanting to look down on somebody? Or am I actually looking at it from the perspective of, I've experienced certain things in my life where I've been enlightened about certain things. I often refer to it as that spiritual door opening, right? So you, you open this door, you peek inside and you're like, oh shit, damn, Re what, really? And then you have a choice. You either slam that shit closed and go, no, nope, I did not see that. That's not real. I'm moving on. Or you go, okay, kick that door open and let's go see where this takes me. Knowing that that unknown is scary. 
And in some cases, it's it's scary from the foundational reality, physical world um, perspective of if I start exploring certain things and then I have beliefs around certain things that are not aligned with the people that are in my life right now, family, my partner, whatever it is, you know, business partners, all that kind of stuff, that it can create real tension and possible separation of all of those things. And quite frankly, I think that is what really scares people the most about going down a quote unquote spiritual journey is just the questioning of everything. The seeking of truth, knowing that there's no one absolute truth. So therefore it's a constant exploration of, you know, elevated thought, expanded wisdom. And it's terrifying for people. I know it's been for me and it still is in certain aspects, right? So I, one of the things that I took away though, was this whole thought around, you know, am I a judgmental person? Well, yes, I am in some ways. I think we all are, but judgment from the perspective of, I have an ex some experiences that I've gone through in my own life. I've seen certain things. I believe I can add value to others by sharing those experiences and allow them to have it guide them on their journey, however they see fit, not projecting my values or my beliefs or, or anything onto anybody else, but rather just saying, if I don't share what I've learned along the way, then I'm robbing that person potentially of a completely different trajectory in their life. And that helped me reframe judgment from judgment to sharing of the truth without expectation. And, and therefore I started to feel really settled and grounded about the idea of like, do I judge people? Yes, I do. Do I judge myself? Yes, I do. Do other people judge themselves? Of course we do. We are human. This is what we do. But when it comes from the true perspective of, uh, wanting to be of service and leading from a place of love, not from a place of fear where we are pushing other people to see things my way, but rather just, you know, in my experience, this is what I believe to be true because of X, Y, and Z. And I'm open to other possibilities. Let's have that conversation. That to me is a truly grounded person. And that's something that I'm aspiring to be. Somebody that can engage in healthy conflict, if you would call it that, even though it's not conflict, but that's how we phrase it is like, if you have one opinion and I have another and we come together, it's going to be conflict. It's not conflict. It's actually helping both of us elevate to a new state of consciousness. And that's ultimately what we're here to do. Is it not? So when I think about judgment now, I'm able to kind of 180 it into a new perspective. And I feel really grounded with that. And that came through the experience. It really did. It really came through the experience. A couple of other things that we had experienced over those 11 hours too. So Yaddy is actually a Wim Hof certified uh, trainer instructor. He's trained directly with Wim in Netherlands, climbed up mountains with him and stuff. Uh, he has such an interesting background. And in fact, I just reached out to him because Mike and I are going to co-host him on an interview for our Extremely Conscious Man podcast. That one just seemed like it was a no brainer for Mike and I to do it together. But Yaddy has uh, a background as a big wave surfer. And I don't even know the full story. And in fact, I'm not even going to go listen to the podcast. I'm just going to ask him the question when we interview him. But he had an accident. Uh, in Tahiti, I want to I want to say, is if I recall that correctly, and it set him down a journey of becoming a healer and ultimately a healer through connectedness, through breath, through uh, cold, through the mushroom experiences, all of these things. Right? It's a very holistic approach. Him and his his wife actually live out at a place called uh, Pachamama, which is just outside of Nazara. And I just looked it up yesterday, actually. It's a gorgeous property and it's an eco village, essentially. He's about 15 minutes away from an incredible surf break. He was pinging me this morning on WhatsApp saying, hey, just hit the surf, amazing waves today. So we're becoming uh, good friends just through the experience that we shared on Saturday. 
And he also led a cacao ceremony. So he prepared a cacao dish for all of us. And oh, it was so good. It actually reminded me a lot of the times when Mike and I were going down to the river when we did our 24 episodes of the Cold Plunge Truth back in West Kelowna. And Mike would prepare the cacao using Himalayan chocolate that he had shipped in. And there was a whole ritual around the way that he even prepared it and whatnot too. So that was pretty amazing. And then there was some breath involved, some breath work involved as well, although it was very kind of a light, just prep, uh, preparation type thing uh, for the mushroom experience. I've also signed up for a Wim Hof Fundamentals experience out of Lacenda again on December 7th uh, that Yaddy's going to be leading. Really looking forward to that because, you know, I love the cold plunging and what it's done for me as well as the breath work. So that's going to be a full day of understanding fundamentals, understanding the breath, getting to experience the cold plunging with a group of people at Lacenda in the labyrinth outside. Oh, it's going to be amazing. So that, that was the experience, but coming out of it, this was the biggest thing that I wanted to really share. And it's kind of adding on to a post that Ayama shared recently, which I'll link up on this podcast, because I'd love everybody to be able to see this, to see it in her words as well. But as everybody was sharing about their experience throughout the night and how they were feeling in the morning and stuff. There's always a little bit of hesitation, just like there is at the start of the nights. You know, again, there's this, our egos step in front of us and say, don't go too deep because if you go deep and you make a fool out of yourself, you're gonna feel dumb or whatever the case might be. There's all these stories that we tell ourselves of like why we need to protect ourselves, why we need to keep that armor shield on top of us, why vulnerability and honesty and truth is dangerous. And this was just another example of how when you actually crack through that armor and in fact shatter that shit and just show up with vulnerability, honesty and truth, it cracks open the permission for others to do the same. And Ayama actually started by sharing about a loss that her and Yadi had experienced. So they had a cat for 13 years and it was a part of their family. It was, you know, 13 years, that's, that's a long time to have a pet. And when she traveled over to Israel, her cat actually passed away. And when she came back, there was this loss that they had felt. And that was one experience about death because there was a, a lot of conversation about death at the end of this um, mushroom experience as well. But the other one was, was she was sharing about the idea of having kids and not knowing exactly what direction they were going to go, but considering adoption. And it was in that moment that I, it just hit me again, where I was thinking, okay, I came into this experience wanting to actually connect with the kids that Sharmila and I lost. Rayan, who was the first child that we lost to preterm birth late in, in the pregnancy, and then India. And India was a, a completely like Rayan was a, a very painful experience, of course, because it was the first time, um, but it wasn't as far along and we didn't get to hold or see anything. So it, it had a different level of um, pain associated to it, I guess you would say. With India, we were far enough along that the, the baby was um, delivered and the doctors had said that she had no life. To her like there was no breath no nothing and they asked if i wanted to hold her so i had her in my hands and she was about the size of you know from my fingertips to the to the back of my hand it was about that big and the body was moving like it was it was pulsing it appeared as though there was a breath there but they even they the doctors said like there's no breath just so you know it's just the nerves and stuff whatnot in the body but it felt like the breath it really did and at that time, it was devastating. And I still, to this day, think about that moment. It comes back to me from time to time where I'm like, oh my God, that was such a painful experience. Like I still remember being in that hospital uh, room, the delivery room, and, and just thinking, how could this possibly have happened? This is devastating. Like there was all of this buildup and then all of a sudden it was over. And we didn't have any kids at that time. So the thought was going in my head of like, is this not meant to be? Will I never be a dad? Is it not in my cards? I really want to be, but 
maybe it's not for me. And it's, it's such a lonely and, and just uh, sad experience to go through. It really was. And yeah, when she, when a few people shared before I ultimately jumped in and I talked about that, I talked about that experience and I talked about the fact that I did actually feel a connection to those kids while I was in the experience throughout the night. Um, it was very subtle. It wasn't any like thing, like something hovering over top of my head, nothing like that. It was just a calmness and a, and a clarity and a, and an understanding that that loss was actually a gift. The pain actually has now transferred into power because that breath or lack thereof that was in my daughter's body was my constant reminder that I get to be grateful for the simplest things in life, like breath, like being here right now, being able to even record this, being able to be out in the waves today. Like I went surfing today. It was, it was amazing. I didn't catch any waves. I was mostly just kind of bouncing around out there, but just knowing that what a blessing this is to just be alive. And now I have this grounded knowing that that loss, that pain was actually there to serve me. It happened for me, not to me. What a gift, what a gift. Through the pain, I found power. So I shared that. And then I also shared the fact that, in fact, I'll try and show it on the screen here. I, I drew this before we even started the, the night. Where is it? There we go. So this right here is a infinity symbol that is poorly, uh, <laughs> poorly uh, drawn, but essentially Sharmila has a small tattoo on her arm. That's an infinity symbol with the two kids names, Rain and India in Hindi. And I have the same thing on a tattoo right here, right there. So one name is here and the other one is here. And this tattoo, in fact, was redrawn and redesigned when we were in Thailand, right before Logan was born, actually, too. And it used to be a dragon head. So this, this right here across, across there was a dragon head. So all of this stuff here, the loops and all of that didn't exist before. And I got that tattoo when I was 18. And I still remember doing it. I went in with my buddy, Trevor Winkler. <laughs> Shout out to Trevor if you're listening. And... We, we were on a party weekend and we thought, let's go get tattoos. And we walked into a shop and just like my first tattoo that I got, in fact, you know what? I'm going to stand up and show this one too, if I can. So this one right here, this shark I got when I was 16 years old in Saskatchewan in Fort Coppell, Saskatchewan at Custer's. So anybody from Saskatchewan that uh, knows tattoo shops will know Custer's, but I remember there's actually significance in both of these. The shark one, I remember getting thinking like, that's cool. And then also I had this underlying fear of sharks living in Saskatchewan. I'd never even been close to an ocean up until the first like 25 years of my life. But I had this fear of sharks. Imagine that, right? And now today I'm out on this surfboard, just bobbing around in the water, looking around at the shore and out into the ocean and looking at the waves coming in and feet dangling in the water. And it doesn't even cross my mind anymore. It really doesn't. You know, there's times where you're kind of like, shit, I'm quite a ways out in the water here right now, but there's no fear there anymore. There's just a connection to nature and then just a gratitude for like, holy shit, I'm out in the ocean right now. I live here. I'm doing this at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. This is my life. I chose this. I created this. In fact, you could even say that I created the intention for this and the overcoming of the fear of sharks at the age of 16 when I got that damn tattoo on my leg. You could say that. Why not? But back to this one, though. So the dragon tattoo, I talked about this today on a post where I shared a picture of a, a dragonfly uh, pen, like a, um, a metal pendant or whatever, like a little statue type thing of a dragonfly that was gifted to us by Ayama. Because as I was explaining this whole idea of 
you know, my connection to the kids that we lost. And then the reminder, which this um, infinity symbol here, it's got the two kids that we lost, but then I also put Logan's name on there and Bodie's name on there. And then I put Finn's name on there because Finn became our first kid. When we lost those first two kids, we got Finn. Then we had Logan, then we had Bodie. And when I look at that whole thing, there's still a piece missing there. And that piece to me is something that Charmella and I have talked about, which is adopting a girl at some point. And I don't know when it's gonna be, but I remember Ayama even saying when she was talking that she's been leaving the space to feel the pain of the loss of her cat, for example, right? She's not rushing out to get another cat to fill the void of the loss. And that this is healthy. This is what we should be doing as humans, not trying to always fix things with this instant gratification and pleasure seeking. This is not healthy. It's not healthy to do that. It's kind of like being in a relationship, breaking up and immediately going into a new relationship, owning a business, selling it, feeling the relief of like, oh, that's done. And then feeling the anxiety of like, shit, I don't know who I am without a business like that. Let me go start another one. This is a pattern for people in this world, including myself. I've suffered for this from this over and over and over again. And I was reminded again about adoption. I thought, yeah, we get to adopt a little girl when the time is right. I don't feel the pressure to do it right now, but it was just a reminder again. And then this is when the magical part happened. And Yama uh, actually shared about this in a post. Oh, the kids just got home, so I might have somebody busting in here. But the guy that I was talking about who was sitting up straight the whole ceremony, he actually shared this incredible story about the fact that he was adopted as a child, like at 10 months old. And this whole connection that he had to his mother who he had never met and his father and the fact that he was, you know, born out of wedlock and like just this incredible story and how he's come to terms and integrated that into his being and, and what his purpose is in this world. It was magical. And then the lady next to him said, I was also adopted. And she shared about her experience and how that impacted her in the way that she was raised and why she's chosen now with her own kids to be able to bring them into experiences like this when they're 20 years old and what that's actually doing for her son to act to live a true life of freedom away from the typical you know go to school go to college get a job make some money buy a house all that kind of stuff because she even mentioned that her son had all of his friends living that life. And they actually moved out of Costa Rica or to Costa Rica for that reason. That was part of it because they realized that their environment was creating the space for him to feel drawn and pulled in that direction, even if he didn't want to do it. So she said, I'm going to create the space for my child to be able to explore what it is, who it is they want to be in this world. And that's just magical. And those connected conversations like that just still blows my mind but at the same time of course that happened and it just reminded me of how powerful i can be when i show up in my vulnerable honest truth and i say out loud the kind of thing that makes my stomach turn a little bit and i think geez are people going to judge me about this and i do it anyways knowing that no People won't judge me. In fact, it may unlock something for somebody that they had buried so deep inside they hadn't even thought of before and, and allow them to have a breakthrough because of it. And that's exactly what happened. Everybody afterwards was like hugging and exchanging phone numbers and saying like, we need to meet for dinner. It was incredible. And we didn't talk to each other before. That was only at the end that we actually talked. And by the end of it, we were like, oh my God, we are all connected. Like this experience, prove to us how connected we actually are. And that was the whole um, foundation around the mycelium pathways and the education side of understanding that this network of mushrooms and the mycelium that connects all of these trees and, and the mushrooms and people and everything, it's so powerful beyond what we can even comprehend. And yet, there's still limited research that's done on this. There's still limited acknowledgement to the power of this medicine. Now, I don't wanna turn this into a bashing of the complete opposite side of like, well, cause it's the politics and the pharmaceuticals and blah. We all know the truth or maybe you don't. And again, 
Am I judging you if you choose to put the blinders on and say, oh my God, I can't believe you did drugs. That's so horrible. And then you go and pop your pills in order to make you feel better. Yes, I judge people for that. I do. But I do it from a place of understanding and, and cracking that door open, those cabinets and going, wait a second. Okay, I'm pretty judgmental of this too, but like, shit, I can't ignore that. That right there blows my mind. Like, how do you ignore that? And there's so much incredible information out there. And of course, the media is going to want to spin a lot of this stuff and say, it's misinformation, but go and explore the truth for yourself. The kids are home. Okay. On that note, I just want to finish this off with just one second, son. I'm almost done. Okay. I just want to finish it off with one more thing. <laughs> Sometimes we have to just surrender to exactly what is presented in front of us, including when your kids are banging on the door and shaking things and saying, I want your attention, daddy. I have choices right now too. I can feel the pressure and want to like pause this and come back to it. Or I can say, I've said everything that I need to here today. This has been an amazing download of my experience. And now I'm going to go give my son a hug <laughs> and probably take them in the pool. So thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being here and stay tuned for some more incredible episodes and some interviews that I'm going to be doing very soon. Okay. Coming son. See you later. Oh, you have a cookie for me? Oh, well, I got to go. I got a cookie waiting for me. See everyone. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Trevor Turnbull Show. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please consider subscribing on my YouTube channel, as well as on your favorite podcast platform. So until next time, remember, today is a beautiful day of opportunity. Trust that you are exactly where you're supposed to be. So be grateful, be curious, and be brave.